In this video, we're going to talk about identifying an unknown carabid beetle. And so there are four types of resources we want to think about and talk about how we can use them together to identify our unknown beetle. So for this example, this picture here, this dorsal picture of this pinned beetle and this ventral picture of a pinned beetle is going to be our unknown. And one resource we might use are uh, other specimens that we have in a teaching or reference collection to make comparisons. Uh, we're not going to talk much about that in this video, but that's an incredibly good resource. Our primary resource that we'll be using is a dichotomous key used to identify uh, this specimen. And here we have Ball and Bousquet, 2001, their Carabid chapter from American Beetles. We also have images, so things like Bug Guide, perhaps the best resource for species images for North American beetles. Uh, this is great. There are all sorts of pictures for all of these different taxa, and they're arranged taxonomically. It's an incredibly useful resource that should be used, but needs to be used carefully because it can get you into a lot of trouble if you don't use them correctly. The final resource that we want to think about are species treatments. And for this example, we'll, we'll talk about the Catalog of Geodefiga by Bousquet from 2012. This is an open access article. Uh, which has a catalog and, and entries for all species uh, in North America. So we're going to be looking at this beetle here. And uh, first thing we want to do when we come to a key is really get a sense for how is this key put together? What's the structure of it? And so before I even read it or start to work my way through, I'm just going to kind of start to get an idea of, of how this is put together. And so for instance, this is a common thing we see in a lot of keys. I notice right off the bat that the first five or six couplets here, they don't do big splits of splitting things in half or thirds or anything like that, but it's, it's getting out these oddball taxa, these, these maybe weird things or single things that, that the author of this key thought, you know what, we better just get these sorted out at the beginning so we don't have to deal with them later. And these are important things to just kind of note and to learn that, hey, these, are, these might be odd or rare things. And if I know them, I can just jump past all these couplets and start, say, down at couplet six. The other thing about this chapter, which you know if you've ever used it before, is that um, there are quite a few couplets here, uh, 67 couplets in the first key, but then there are multiple other sub keys. And that this first key actually gives you a, a tribe or a group of genera, and then you have to go to another key to get to genus in large part. So um, this is just kind of good to know that, oh yes, there are a lot of different keys um, and I need to keep that in mind. Uh, and so as I get comfortable with this group, I may uh, know that actually I have a species of carabus. And so I want to come here to this key to just jump to the subgenera and look at it. Um, but I want to remember that the other keys above this are still there, and oftentimes I'm going to have to jump back and look for that. So now, um, the other thing you want to do, especially the first few times you go through a key, are, are notice these main splits. And so the first instance of this I noticed just by glancing through is couplet six. Oh, seven to 21. This is a big split that's going to split off a large number of taxa. This is probably a character I want to remember and try to train myself to always look for whenever I get an unknown beetle. Um, it's just going to make this faster. These are the, the and it's likely an important character for the group. So these are just the types of things that I want to start building on as I get more familiar with the key. The last thing I want to keep in mind with keys is that um, no key is perfect, and uh, you never go through it um, exactly once for every specimen that these really are things that you need to work with and play with, and that oftentimes you'll come to a couplet and you'll not be sure which way to go, and you actually need to go both ways. You need to remember that, you need to go back and forth and kind of see what fits and what makes sense and where you are. And this is a way that we can really pair this uh, with some image resources to really help us make use of keys. So those are the general um, things that we need to know about keys. And now we'll go through the specific uh, example of a beetle, which might be a little bit longer, but we'll actually go through, identify this beetle, and see uh, what we think it is. So again, as I mentioned, uh, these first several couplets of this key, it's going to be very important. I'm actually going to pretty much jump through these, but um, we'll see, oh, you know, the antennae are, are concealed from above, or 
um, oh, the scutellum is not visible. That's weird. And, and so these are sorts of things that um, we want to maybe start just kind of memorizing in a way. And we want to know what's this one-off omophron. And so we can go here to bug guide and we can look at, at this um, pretty distinctive looking little carabid, this really rounded body thing. There's a number of examples there. And oh yeah, there's no scutellum. Well, if I know to look for that and I know what omophron looks like, now I don't have to come through this couplet every single time that I do this key. So I know that I don't have any of these kind of diagnostic, um, really identifiable groups that are in the first five couplets. And so I'm gonna work my way down to couplet six. And here I get to our first really dividing point where the middle coxal cavities are disjunct or not entirely closed or they're conjunct, meaning closed. Then, and what this means is we can look at this ventral view of this beetle. We can come down conveniently. This leg here is missing, right? This is our middle leg. Um, here we have the trochanter. And so, so here we have the coxa and the trochanter. And, and together, um, this is a coxal cavity where this leg kind of sinks into the body and we can see these plates around it. And if we zoom in, uh, this isn't the best image, but this is the metasternite and the mesosternite. And we can see that they clearly touch. And um, we see that we don't have this plate here. We don't have the, um, the mesepimeron extending in to touch this margin of the coxal cavities. So in fact, these coxal cavities are considered conjunct. And so we're here and we're going, instead of going to couplet seven, move on to couplet 21 and make some good progress. Now here, we're going to uh, have to start looking at some more characters. Maxillary palpamere four, obliquely um, inserted into palpamere three. And again, we can do this maybe from the ventral view. Now, if I had this specimen, I would be manipulating this in my hand constantly. You can't count on having a single uh, view to, to help you identify your beetle. But here we can see that our maxillary palpamere here is inserted just right at the edge, the tip of the palpamere three. And we can see this from the top two. It's just pretty normal. So we can move on to couplet 22. Um, here it's saying the elytron has a broad transverse sulcus on the basal third. Well, let's look at the elytron here. Um, there's not a, a transverse sulcus here, but, but maybe I don't fully understand what that character means, right? Because we only have one specimen. Maybe I've never seen whatever this couplet is referring to. And so I wanna be sure. And again, this is a great time to use a picture resource. So here we see that there's actually one genus, Ega in the Lacnophorini. And so I can go to, to bug guide and I can look and okay, here's a species. And um, well, right away I can tell that this is not this critter, right? These are very different species. But I still want, when I'm looking at this picture, to find the character. And so what is this talking about? And if we zoom in, we can see, oh, there is this transverse band here that's sunken in. Well, now that I know that, I'm probably never going to have to look this up again. And I don't necessarily have to remember exactly what this thing looks like to know that I don't have it here. So we can move on to couplet 23. Now here's where things start to get um, a little bit more interesting to identify. So head with one superorbital puncture or uh, two. And so here we can come to our dorsal image, come down to the head and um, we're looking right above the eye. And again, this is a very top down picture and this may not be the best view to view this in. I'd probably hold this obliquely a little bit from the side so that I could kind of get a good angle in. Um, here on this side, we can see we have the ceta coming into this puncture. On this side, we've lost the ceta, but we still have the puncture. And so this is a thing where it's always important for this type of character to look on both sides to make sure you're not missing something because perhaps um, this is the top of a ceta. In, in this case, this is just a little piece um, of dirt or sand that's on the specimen. Um, and we see it's not mirrored over here, but we're gonna wanna check both sides and look both for a ceta sticking out, but also for a puncture that looks maybe right here that it could have borne a ceti. But in this case, we only have one over um, each eye. So we're going 
to go to 24. So 24, um, are our eyes absent? No, we have pretty big eyes. It's always nice when we get some characters like this. We don't have to spend much time. We can quickly move to 25 is the apex of the electron truncate. Um, again, pretty easy character. No, it's not um, truncate and our body is not covered in short CD as this is talking about. So, okay, let's move on. We're now up to 26. Great. Uh, labial palpamere three, is it my new subulate and inserted then a cavity at the tip of two? So here we wanna go back to our ventral side and we'd be moving this beetle around. Um, now we can't quite see it. Again, this is not the best angle, but because this is kind of curved and, and we're looking straight down at it, um, but we'd be manipulating this specimen to really get a flat view of this final uh, palpamere, palpamere three, and we'd actually see that it's just as long as two. It's not inserted into a little cavity, so it's definitely not um, this couplet here. It's not microtopus. So we're going to go to 27. Okay, 27. This is another character um, that is is pretty useful to start um, getting a hang of, is how many antennomeres are covered with CD. So are 5 to 11 covered with CD throughout? where one through four have just a ring around the apex, or um, are three to 11 or four to 11 covered with CD where only one to two or one to three, right? So we wanna read both sides of this couplet whenever we come to a new couplet. We really wanna to try to understand what um, this is talking about. So really we're looking at a difference of one through four with this character state of a ring of CD or one to two or one to three, right? So, um, and this is important because we don't necessarily at this couplet need to know whether the third one has it. We just need to know whether the fourth one has it. And here we can pretty clearly see one, two, oh, three. Definitely, this is just a covered in CD, right? Just like the rest of the antenna mirrors. And we can look again from the top, try to look from multiple angles. One, two, yeah, these have these kind of rings of CD around the tip. and. Okay, three onward, definitely CETOS, as opposed to here, one, two, three, four. No, these, these four are definitely not similar to each other. So we're going to 29, um, so, that, so that's great. Now, once we get to 29, it's gonna ask for our elytral margin ha has um, an internal plica uh, towards the apex or has one or does not have one. Um, now, this is a difficult character to actually see. Once you've seen it, um, uh, it's pretty obvious, but you can't see it in either the dorsal or, unfortunately, this ventral shot. Um, in fact, this does not have a plica, um, but we can't quite see that here. It's kind of covered by the abdomen. And so let's say, you know, we're not super sure about this, this character. Well, okay. Um, but uh, what are the other characters now in this couplet that we can use to help us? Um, for instance, antennomeres one to two only with a ring of long CD or um, two to three with a long ring of CD, right? Now, remember we already looked at this, one and two kind of have this ring of CD and the third one is different from the second. So, so that helps. We're probably sitting here looking at, at harp aligning. But, you know, let's say we're just not quite sure. Maybe we're missing an antenna or both of our antennae um, and we were able to get to here but, uh, but we're just not quite sure. So this is, could be an example of where maybe we wanna go, um, we, okay, we know we could either go here to Harpalini or we could move on to 30. And we'll just see if that works. So if we move on to 30, um, what is this asking? Labial palpamere two um, with a margin pluricetos um, or does it, is it bicetose or glabrous, right? So is it two or two or less or say three or more on our labial palpamere two? So we can come here and um, scroll in. Again, this is kind of um, difficult to see. Here's palpamere one, here's palpamere two, but under the microscope, I was able to see, you can see at least two there, but there's actually um, a whole bunch. So this is pluricetose. Well, okay, hey, this is pluricetos. Could it possibly be this, right? So, so remember that this is dichotomous, presumably meaning we only ever have to look at one couplet, but we wanna make sure that we're not um, closing ourselves off to other options that are important later. 
So it does pretty much fit here, but it could maybe potentially fit in this first couplet of 30, um, where it says, oh, there's only one species, Amara hyperborea. Okay, well, let's see if we can find a picture of that online. And there is one picture online. Um, and, you know, that doesn't look quite like our critter. We see this pronotum is pretty wide towards the back. And, and this one, it looks like it's narrowed. Um, but it's not distinctly not our critter. Now, if you've been working on carabids, you would know that these are pretty different looking. Um, but, you know, let's say that this is, a, this is an example of where um, picture matching can be very dangerous. We want to be looking for characters. If you can use the picture to identify a character that is very distinct, that's great. But maybe here we're not super comfortable looking at these two pictures and knowing that they're different species. And that's fine. Um, so let's also maybe take into account uh, a species treatment. And so here we can go to the catalog of Geodefiga um, and we can look for Amara hyperborea. And we can see that, oh, hey, there's a bunch of synonyms. So this has been described a bunch of times. And maybe this is because people were unaware of each other's works, or perhaps it's because it's a very variable species that's difficult to identify. And so, so that might give us an idea that, hey, let's maybe just because the pronotum doesn't look just right, let's take a closer look for a second. But we see this is a whole Arctic species, so it's in the New World and the Old World, um, right, from Finland to the Pacific Coast in Mongolia, in Northeastern China. Oh, wow, okay. But, it, and here in the New World, it's from Alaska to Newfoundland um, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And right, and we can see that here. Well, for our NEON project, uh, this specimen is from Virginia. Well, this is great because in case we had any question of whether it was supposed to be here, this species is really not in Virginia. There's no reason for it to be there. Um, Nothing perhaps is impossible, but it's not that. So this is a way to use something like an external resource. You could use a catalog to look at distributions or a revision. And that really helps us rule out this couplet 30. And we know that this really isn't the way to go because if it's not this Amara hyperborea, then the labial palpamere would have had to have been Bicetos or Glabrus. So now we have more confidence that this does belong to the tribe, Harpaline, and we can go uh, to key 34.